So, Amir, thank you very much. Um, if I had known that Joyce Carol Oates was here, I might not have been here. <laughs> I might have been with her. So thank you all for, for coming. Uh, and Amir, thank you for that introduction. It reminds me of that story about wishing that my parents were here because my father would have enjoyed hearing everything you've said and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, so one of the most remarkable and distinctive features of American life is its enormous third sector. Comprised of over one million tax exempt nonprofit organizations e eligible to receive tax deductible gifts. This realm of society is quantitatively enormous. It is also qualitatively critical to America's well being and to its global competitive standing. Older than the founding of the nation by more than a century, the growth adaptability and scale of America's nonprofit sector, including its tangible results, is uniquely impressive. Numbers matter. So permit me to count a few of the ways these voluntary institutions devoted to the public good become indispensable contributors to the nation's dynamic economic and social capital. Sheer size, nonprofits enjoy $4.8 trillion of assets and spend over $2 trillion annually. They account for somewhere between 5.4 and 6.5% of the nation's gross domestic product. Growing faster for the last quarter century than either government or the business sector, these 1.5 million nonprofit organizations, one for every 213 Americans, owns 11% of the value of all of the nation's real estate. Employment, as of 2011, nonprofit institutions employed 11.4 million workers, over 10% of the entire U.S. labor force, one out of every seven white collar workers in the country. They also happen to represent about 10% of all salaries and wages. This nonprofit paid workforce is the third largest of any U.S. industry behind only retail trade and manufacturing, but larger than construction, finance, insurance, and transportation combined. Volunteers, the intellectual and sweat equity of volunteers from hospital, museum, and university trustees to candy stripers, docents, and alumni associations is telling as a critical source of social capital. In total, these volunteers, replete throughout the third sector, represent no less than another 4.5 million full-time equivalent workers. One in four Americans volunteer for a total estimate of $8.1 billion of work valued at $163 billion. If their rank and file are added to paid employment, the third sector enjoys America's largest workforce by far. So taken together, more Americans donate time and treasure to nonprofit organizations than vote, even in the most highly contested presidential elections. More Americans donate time and treasure 
to nonprofit organizations, then own stock in American companies, even if one includes 401k and pension fund plans. These are utterly remarkable and potent facts. Philanthropy, none other than the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy found that in 2014, American corporations, foundations, and individuals contributed $358.38 billion, 80% of which came from citizens in live or testamentary gifts. That figure is 7.1% higher than the prior year and represents 2.1% of the gross domestic product. In fact, for many years, Americans gave more money to charity than they saved. The average U.S. household gave $2,030 to charity in 2014. The nation's approximately 80,000 foundations in 2014 controlled about $845 billion of assets and made grants of $43.7 billion. These funds are heavily concentrated in few places. About 70% of all foundation assets belong to 2% of the nation's foundations. Fields of interest. Political scientist Lester Solomon of Johns Hopkins University usefully delineates the roles of nonprofits and illuminates their five functions. The service function, the advocacy function, the expressive function, the community building function, and the value guardian function. All are important, but if we confine ourselves to the service role, nonprofit organizations comprise fully half of this nation's hospitals, one-third of its clinics and home health care services, 40% of its higher education institutions, 70% of its family service agencies, 90% of its symphonies, ballet companies, performing arts centers, operas, and museums and 95% of the delivery vehicles for foreign disaster assistance and help to refugees and economic immigrants. Indeed, one of the fastest growing elements of this sector are private elementary and secondary schools. Demand for them far exceeds supply, and few for-profit organizations are entering this field with any significant measure of success. Overall, these statistics mean that in dozens of American cities, nonprofits comprise as many as half of the largest 25 employers. Labor intensive by definition, universities, hospitals, sectarian charities, social service and cultural institutions rank high in size by worker count and by annual operating expenses. In no small measure, the best of these organizations help to account for why people want to live and work in proximity to them and why foreign citizens flock to American shores for their health care, their education, and cultural encounters. Now, I know there are some economists in the room who may be disappointed in this observation. But not everything that can be measured counts. And not everything that counts means a great deal. In the 20th century, Credit must be given to nonprofit institutions 
and the patient capital of foundations that supported them with qualitative achievements, like the creation of the 911 emergency telephone system, like the agricultural revolution enabling India and China to become self-sufficient in food production, like the flourishing of national public television and radio, and the inventiveness that animated and animates thousands of successful patent applications each year. The elimination of yellow fever in the developing world and hookworm in the southern United States are additional illustrations of third sector success. And so is the initiation of studies in molecular biology, in foreign policy, in computational neurobiology, in mind-brain research, and in dispute resolution. These are only some of the products of university and research institute activity that are fueled by charitable dollars. The most significant anti-poverty measure designed to help the working poor in the last four decades is the Earned Income Tax Credit. It was the nonprofit think tank, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, that nurtured this idea and its extension to the states. The welfare to work program as a path to self-sufficiency could not have been effective without model programs and measurement techniques mastered by the nonprofit Manpower Research Demonstration Corporation. And it was the Robert Wood Johnson and Annie Casey Foundations that deserve credit for the expansion of health services to poor children in a federal program enacted by Congress in 1997 called CHIP, the Child Health Insurance Program. Not far behind, nearly every successful social movement after World War II in America, you will find a set of nonprofit advocacy organizations aggregating interests and mobilizing support for their favorite cause. Think civil rights, civil liberties, human rights, women's rights, privacy protections, the environmental movement, support for the physically abled, disabled, for the mentally handicapped, for freedom in the nations that comprise the former Soviet Union, for the end to apartheid in South Africa. These are no mean accomplishments. The illustrative 21st, 20th century achievements I have selected are already being matched only 15 years into the 21st century. The disappearance of polio, the prospect of eliminating from the face of the earth AIDS, cholera, and malaria in as little as a decade from now. The burgeoning charter school movement, the marriage equality movement, the early successes in addressing the human causes of climate change, the invention of an anti-Ebola vaccine. These are only a few of the points to be placed on the nonprofit scorecard. And each of you, I'm confident, could add many of your own to that list. Notwithstanding this economic prowess and these impressive accomplishments, Nonprofits are challenged on many fronts. Competition from business, declines in government support, technological disruptions, the pricing out of many consumers who can no longer afford to pay nonprofit fees and ticket costs, the potential risks to the integrity of nonprofit missions. And most significantly, rising to the high standard 
of properly governing increasingly complex and demanding institutions. Because viewing the governance challenge is so critical to addressing all other major issues, let me pause to examine its dimension and its gravity in some detail. The larger question into which governance is nestled has to do with trust and accountability. Americans, according to every reliable public opinion poll, have never in the history of our country trusted government or corporations less, nor have they ever believed as much that performance failures carry virtually no significant cost to those responsible for them. In government, Think Katrina, the war in Iraq, the failure of our Secret Service to protect our president, the breakdown of service delivery in our Veterans Administration health care delivery system, or the successful cyber attack on the personnel records of millions of government employees. In business, think Enron. Arthur Anderson, WorldCom, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Countrywide, and Merrill Lynch. These corporations are no more. They were victims of largely self-inflicted wounds, of the failure to manage risk, and of leadership and governance gone astray. These egregious acts of omission and commission, unfortunately, have their counterparts in the nonprofit sector, even though they are less well known and less well publicized. The roles I have played as the Chief Executive Officer of the 92nd Street Y, an internationally renowned community and cultural center, then the International Rescue Committee, and then Lincoln Center, America's oldest and the world's largest and most prominent performing arts institution, have all allowed me to encounter professionals and trustees at their very best, fully aligned, thoroughly committed, remarkably successful, extremely generous, and utterly devoted to the discharge of their missions. The results, countless lives saved, the sick healed, students well-educated, clients trained for jobs, the mentally ill restored to health, and millions exposed to the very best in the performing and visual arts that our planet has to offer. Nonprofits can rescue refugees and displaced people and reunite children separated from their families. They can eliminate diseases from the face of the earth and they can revolutionize the delivery of health, educational, social, and cultural services using the wonders of 21st century technology. They can do all of these things. And they can do much more when leadership is encouraged and when vital energy is aimed directly at the client and at the cause. Sadly, I have also witnessed up close and personal institutional disarray and dereliction of duty. It is very distressing to encounter professionals who do not measure up to the conduct that those they serve have every right to expect. It is painful to observe trustees in positions of authority who permit such deficient behavior in those who report to them. And when such trustees are themselves casual about the discharge of their solemn responsibilities, I despair. 
When trustees and those who report to them perform poorly, troubles abound. The New York City Opera vanishes. Yeshiva University so mishandles its investment portfolio as to bring this 128-year-old academic institution, including the Einstein School of Medicine and the Cardozo School of Law, to the brink of bankruptcy. The University of Virginia fires its president, Margaret Sullivan, arbitrarily and capriciously, and then quickly reverses course in the face of unprecedented, highly visible student, faculty, and alumni protests. Such failures of governance are more prevalent than is commonly appreciated. The Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Arts slides into desperate financial straits. Its board acquiesces in the appointment of New York City gallery owner Jeffrey Deitch as its CEO. That news and his decision to fire a highly regarded senior curator results in the resignation of four trustees, the only visual artists on the board. Staff tumult and negative publicity ensue. Deitch resigns 30 months after his appointment, leaving the museum in disarray. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences Board of Directors publicly acknowledges that its CEO of 17 years, Leslie Cohn Berlowitz, had misrepresented her academic record, never received the PhD she claimed to have won, and was way overpaid. The trustees did not discharge their duty to verify key biographical claims, nor did they monitor compensation by ensuring fairness and a measure of comparability. In short, they failed to perform as a responsible fiduciary. The Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. agrees to a controversial takeover by George Washington University in a deal signed on May 14, 2014. Many charge that the museum had relinquished its mission totally in the transaction due only to trustee unwillingness to preserve its independence by giving and raising adequate funds. The 80-year-old Federation Employment and Guidance Service in New York City suddenly declares bankruptcy, leaving its needy clients bereft of vital service and its creditors with little recourse. From such illustrations, there are many lessons to learn. Mercifully, there are also safeguards, checks and balances to prevent such conduct or to expose and remedy it. Audiences, students, patients, and doctor, donors can vote with their dollars and their feet when universities, museums, or hospitals lose their way. Attendance falls. Applications for admissions drop. Donations plummet. Journalists report on the travails of what are, after all, public institutions. Accreditation commissions and peer review procedures are healthy forms of institutional discipline and reform. And those withstanding can resort to the judicial system for relief. Now, contrast these forces at work monitoring nonprofits with their total absence in the domain of private foundations. Of all parts of the third sector, foundations stand apart 
for the pervasive weakness of their accountability. They have no real customers. Few, if any, grantees or aspirants to that status would dare criticize a financial official. Dwight McDonald once observed in describing one philanthropic fund, quote, the Ford Foundation, it is a large body of money completely surrounded by people who want a little. If you want a little, then never, never, never run the risk of biting the philanthropic hand that can support you. On any given day, there is very little media coverage of foundation activity, save in the trade press. Self-regulation by the Council on Foundations is weak and ineffectual. Public regulation by state attorneys general or the Internal Revenue Service is episodic at best. And yet these institutions constitute 15% of the $335 billion given to philanthropy last year, or $43 billion. And every single penny of those benefactions is subsidized by you, members of the taxpaying public, with generous incentives that have no equal in any country in the world. <clears throat> what prevents these relatively insulated private foundations from engaging in illegal, unethical, or unprofessional conduct? Who ultimately is accountable for the efficiency, effectiveness, and comportment of grant making? It's only the trustee. In the definitive work in this field, Joe Fleischman identifies arrogance, discourtesy, inaccessibility, arbitrariness, the failure to communicate, and constant changes in priorities as the besetting sins of private foundations. These important entities in American life need reform and they need closer oversight. So the trustees of nonprofit organizations and foundations must safeguard the interests of clients and grantees. Above all, they must hold professionals accountable for the discharge of institutional mission with fidelity to law, regulation, and financial and program requirements. These vital public service entities are not private organizations, let alone country clubs or places where friends gather. Social and professional relationships must be set aside inside the boardroom. Differences of view should not be muffled. Rather, trustees are obligated to voice their informed views, to take the business affairs of their favorite cause seriously, and when necessary, even to resign from office on principle. By asking the right questions, setting the appropriate measures, and insisting on responsiveness, openness, modesty, and professionalism, trustees can exercise influence on both nonprofit performance and on foundation conduct. And in my experience, little else can. And when trustees and those who report to them perform superbly, institutions take flight those who work inside them soar as proud professionals. Those who receive their services are changed for the better. In my lifetime, institutions like New York University, Duke, 
Johns Hopkins, Stanford, the University of Michigan, the University of Texas, and the City University of New York have catapulted to levels of accomplishment that once seemed to me highly improbable. Small liberal arts colleges like Amherst, Haverford, Cremona, Reed, Middlebury, and Vassar have distinguished themselves. And what about the Mayo and Cleveland clinics, New York Presbyterian and Emory University hospitals, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Metropolitan, the Steppenwolf Theater Company, and, I had to throw this in, Lincoln Center Theater. My list is partial and arbitrary. Yours will be as good or better. Why? Because attracted to so many nonprofit institutions of higher education, healthcare, and the arts, and to so many other fields of endeavor in the third sector, are professionals of uncommon talent. They are committed to their work. They aspire to excellence. And when they are supported by trustees who take their measure, mind their missions, and invest in their future, hundreds, if not thousands, of nonprofits can flourish. At their best, trustees and senior management struggle to strengthen the nonprofit institutions they are privileged to lead. America's third sector is distinctive. It is large, sprawling, and influential. And its very pluralism strengthens our common wheel. Mediating between the powerful state and individual citizens, nonprofits protect us from tyranny and help to support participatory democracy. And the high quality services delivered by many draw patients, students, and tourists to our shores from all around the world. The challenges to third sector vitality and excellence, though they may begin with governance and accountability, hardly end there. Consider for a moment the hospital president. What share of America's approximately 100 thousand deaths annually, estimated by the Institute for Medicine to occur annually in our hospitals due to medical error, happen on the watch of the CEO and trustees. What about the spread of avoidable infections among inpatients, hospital employees, who do not regularly wash their hands, the mistaken prescription or not administering them in proper doses, the breakdown of triage systems that occurs in overly crowded emergency rooms with unconscionable waiting times, the sleep-deprived residents and overworked, harried nurses whose impaired judgment adversely affects patient care. Surely, if senior executives and hospital trustees owe an obligation to the public, it is first and foremost to remedy these and other sources of medical harm. Carefully monitoring patient lengths of stay, avoiding unnecessary readmissions, assuring that the medically indigent are served with the same care and dignity as third-party reimbursable or self-pay patients? Is measurable progress occurring in each and every one of these problem areas? Or consider the issues facing the private college or university president. How to keep the cost of room, board, and tuition affordable enough to lower the barriers to entry for youngsters from poor and working class families. How to relieve a collective student debt of well over a trillion dollars 
more than all Americans collectively owe on all of their credit cards. How to resist pressures from parents and students and government and prospective employers to transform colleges and universities from educational institutions to vocational institutions. How to keep schools safe places for young men and women where sexual harassment is shunned, emotional distress is detected and addressed, and attention and learning disorders receive ample attention. How to effectively deploy 21st century technology without undermining the value of human interaction, professor to student in the classroom. Are these challenges being addressed frontally? And are trustees holding management accountable for demonstrable progress? And consider the Performing Arts Administration as the cost of labor gallop ahead of inflation, and as ticket prices begin to approach premium levels, what can be done to protect access to the performing arts for the poor and the working class? How can the proper place of the arts in elementary and secondary schools be secured? Can performing arts centers resist succumbing to the coarseness of our popular culture? Can they present the classics and promising new work of high quality rather than shallow entertainment? And can they identify new economic models to sustain themselves? Well, these threats and opportunities are clearly not for the faint of heart or for the unambitious. They are as complex and as taxing as those faced by any politician or any corporate executive. What's needed are accomplished, skilled, and resourceful people to lead nonprofit institutions and occupy seats in their boardroom. What's needed is people like those in this room who yearn to serve beyond self and who wish to convert private resources to the public good. Maybe these issues are best addressed through imaginative use of technology or the analysis of big data. Maybe the keys to unlocking new value in organizations are fresh sources of revenue and novel productivity measures. Maybe gain sharing in collective bargaining can offer a contribution to needed solutions, or new ways to devise incentives that lead to breakthrough ideas. I do not know. But what I am sure of is that brilliant young people can be found in more than Silicon Valley garages, investment firms, and consulting practices, attracting bright minds to third sector habitats and to the formidable challenges to be found there charging them to devise solutions, offering needed resources and the freedom to wander intellectually, and then listening carefully <coughs> to what they formulate cannot help but create a new order of things. Blending the benefits of experienced hands with the unconventional approaches to the relatively uninitiated can lead to answering the very questions that I have posed. And I am certain of something else. Unconstrained by petty partisan politics and the necessity for re-election every two, four, or six years, and uninhibited by the pressure to report quarterly financial results, this American third sector is free to invent, to create, and to innovate. Blessed by diversity in its, in its institutional ranks, 
the sector offers much room for experimentation and for tackling some of this nation's and the world's most pressing challenges. And that is why the health of this realm of American life remains so important. It is why I wish for all of you the excitement, the pleasure, and the gratification of this form of professional or voluntary public service. I always offered all employees, benefactors, trustees, and volunteers four ironclad commitments in return for donations of consequence to Lincoln Center. If you give a significant gift of time, talent, or treasure, I always promised, you will be rewarded with a better night's sleep, with a longer life, with an unobstructed pathway to heaven, and with aisle seats <laughs> when you get there. Lincoln Center is hardly alone as a noble cause or a worthy institution bold enough to offer such guarantees. Life in public service will provide you with the chance to help others, to save lives, relieve pain, educate, elevate, realize dreams, help repair a broken world, even transcend it through the medium of art. There is no material reward, there is no worldly possession that could possibly offer as much pleasure or satisfaction. And that is why I did not listen to the advice of those who said, do not take that job. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So we have an open mic, and we're open to questions, observations, reactions. Who will be first? So I can answer that question kind of uh, broadly. Um, I found uh, for even entry-level employees, let alone mid-career uh, executives, how important it is to remain open. Open to new experiences, open to new ideas, open to new people. Many of you are far away from being 37. I have this theory that something happens to most human beings when they're 37. <laughs> they stay home more. They watch TV more. They close themselves up more. They tend to see the same people, read the same things, go to the same restaurants, travel to the same places, and as a result, they're far less open to challenge, to freshness, to new experience and ideas. So I would encourage all of you to continue to travel often, 
read widely, maintain networks in areas that interest you but may not engage you full-time at work, as good as in, and as enriching any place of employment can be, it can't be the totality of you. I say in my book that in my experience, I was always totally in, but never entirely of, the institution I was part of. Freeman Dyson, the physicist, says if you are swimming inside of a bottle of Coca-Cola, you will learn an enormous amount about the property of the liquid, but you will have long ago forgotten the shape of the bottle. The trustees of those hospitals, where those patients are needlessly dying, have forgotten the shape of the bottle. So I think a complete openness to new experiences, new ideas, mostly gained through reading and meeting and listening carefully, uh, are for me the keys. I quote Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE. The end of 2013, he was being in, in, interviewed by Charlie Rose. And Immelt was asked, it was the end of the year, what will a good 2014 be for you? I thought for sure he was going to say, I've got to get earnings per share up. The stock price has been in the doldrums ever since I was the CEO. I've got to get rid of my, more of my banking assets, um, et cetera, et cetera. He's been the CEO now for more than a decade, and here's what he said. I really hope in 2014 I can finally discipline myself to ask more intelligent questions of the brilliant staff around me and to listen more intently to their answers. And by listen, he said, I mean with a preparedness to change my mind. Wow. It's that kind of receptivity to new notions, new ideas. It's that kind of constant learning that will help you swim in the liquid and see the shape of the bottle. I think there's a young man there with a briefcase in his hand, who had his hand up. One, two, three, four, fifth row, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> But you're not 37, I am not 37. I'm way past 37. So you make numerous references to governance. Is there a way to regulate it more, or should we get some of these companies out of the market? My fear um, is of, of what the negative, unintended consequence of regulation would be. Um, so I'm, I'm a very strong believer in self-regulation. Um, in my book, I actually cite, as I describe the disappearance of the New York City Opera while I was the president of Lincoln Center, and describe how it happened, and describe by name the board members responsible for it happening, as well as the staff which I thank God New York City is the largest city in the country, so I can be there at the same time as those I name can be there. Um, uh, I, I have a reverie that trustees, that there's a certain time in the life of a nonprofit organization that's solemn and special. It's like when a public official takes an oath of office it's like when a doctor takes the Hippocratic Oath. It's when a trustee is nominated and elected and stands outside the boardroom and then 
enters the boardroom, and all the board members applaud this new admission to their ranks. And my reverie is that at that time, the trustee, in front of others, take a pledge, literally a pledge, to um, hold the institution in trust for service to others, to give and acquire resources for the organizations as generously as possible, to hold the CEO accountable for the, his or her responsibilities, and so on, and that the balance of the trustees repeat the pledge. I know that in the Lincoln Center boardroom, in the International Rescue Committee boardroom, in the 92nd Street Y boardroom, had a pledge of the kind that, in far better language in the book, that I outlined would have really powerful meaning. Um, at Lincoln Center, we had a nominating and governance committee. And its job, in addition to nominating new members, was to annually review the performance of every trustee and actively discuss it and feed back to those trustees who were falling under the measure of what we had expected, which was in writing when they came, to give in terms of time and resources a face-to-face -face meeting with the chairman or whomever sponsored them as trustees. And often as a result, the trustees would resign because they were not performing up to the standard we had mutually agreed on. So that kind of self-regulation, I think, is the best. When I've seen state's attorney general intervene, they often really don't know the dynamic of the nonprofit sector. They often sanction in ways that are not harmful to the trustees, they're harmful to the clients. So I, I, I really worry about outside regulation. Yes, sir. Um, well, the besetting sins were applicable most to uh, foundations. Um, so, hard to generalize in higher ed. I have found, uh, I'm a proud graduate of a small liberal arts college, Hobart College. Um, there are too many alumni on the board. There isn't enough of an outside perspective on the board. So it becomes too insular. And the tendency to engage in self-congratulation, too strong. So I think just as every corporation needs outside directors, not just senior employees who serve on the board, and in virtually all public corporations, the majority are outside directors. So I think most um, nonprofit uh, colleges and universities should have a fair number of trustees who are um, distinguished uh, by their governance capability and who are not members of the insiders group or insiders club. Um, I remain very concerned about uh, gubernatorial intervention in the affairs of state universities. Um, whether the University of Virginia case I cited where all of the trustees are appointed by the governor. All of them are appointed by the governor. Most are University of Virginia graduates, but not all. But they're all appointed by the governor. Um, I have read, and I assume my reading is accurate, of the threats to the independence of the University of Wisconsin uh, with uh, Governor Walker uh, intervening sharply in, into those affairs. So I worry very much about the integrity um, and the academic standards of uh, our large uh, public universities. Um, I see distortions, um, and a lot has been written about them. The distortions of athletics, the distortions of legacy admissions, 
um, uh, the distortions of uh, too many administrators and too few teachers. Um, last time I looked, Socrates had no director of housing. You know, it was just Socrates and Mino. Um, so I, I think our universities have some work to do to become more efficient, more effective. Um, I, I would like hospitals that are patient-centered. I'd like performing arts institutions that are audience and artist-centered. I would like universities that are student, learning, and research-centered. Plenty of room for other activities on the periphery, but they shouldn't crowd out that central mission. And the only way to ensure it is by having a relative measure of independence um, in its governance. Enough independence to say no, Mr. Governor. We'll resign rather than invoke this kind of tuition increase or um, uh, this kind of elimination of parts of the curriculum. Um, I'd like to see more of that. There are very few resignations in American life, in the public sector, in the private sector, or in the nonprofit sector. A brilliant sociologist named Albert Hirschman defined this as exercising voice or vote inside private institutions. And trustees have powerful voices, powerful capability of voting if they would but exercise them. Yes, sir. Down here. I'll, I'll let it, if there's a student who wants to go, I don't want to. All right. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, we'll, 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 we'll take yours as well, OK? Uh, go ahead. Really appreciate the way in which you uh, both particularly uh, spoke to the particularities of the nonprofit sector as well as the similarities with the other sectors. And especially the idea that you seem to be hinting at a group thing here within some boards. You know, that I've seen interpretations of the Iraq War in which this notion that common uh, background, common education, common belief system led people not to think beyond a similar thing with Enron. Um, and you know, I'm wondering if in terms of boards, if we look at diversity, the traditional kind of race, gender, class, uh, we don't see much of any of those three. Um, and you know, to me, it seems like class especially is one that often gets left out in terms of diversity. Uh, Ford Foundation has not had a worker on its board, I think, since the 1970s, right? So if you think of, of something like that. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas for how to increase diversity, how, how important you think that is in terms of governance and creating a, um, a different kind of nonprofit, and, and really appreciate the, whatever comments you have. You know, I'm really not sure, um, which is, I'm sure that we need diversity of ideas in the boardroom. I'm not sure that its origins need to be represented by each specific class of people. So the members of the Board Foundation think they work too. Um, it's just a different form of work. It, it, may, it may not be blue collar labor. Um, I do think that uh, part of the reason for this enormous income and wealth gap un undeniably is the diminution of labor unions in this country, uh, which are now down in the private sector to hovering around 7.5% of all employees. Um, John Kenneth Galbraith, when he was uh, alive, famously talked about countervailing power and the need for workers to be organized to present a countervailing power to those who own capital. And we've seen a decline in that, uh, in that countervailing power. But I'm not sure that the best way to get there um, is by uh, too many divisions and classifications of, uh, of people. Uh, I think responsible chairman of boards need to ensure that diverse points of view, backgrounds, are reflected on the board. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that comes about through sensitive work and hard, hard recruitment. Um, it's, it's, it's easier to say that Lincoln Center had few Latinos on its board. Everyone who said that to me, I would say, please give me a few names. 
please give me a few names of those willing and able, and we make adjustments in the requirements for board membership based upon age, capability, financial capability, and so forth. But I'd like a few names. So um, that 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 effort is a a tough one. So I'm going to take one more question, and then I'd like to end with a one final comment. Yes. One of the things that I really like about the nonprofit sector is its diversity. So uh, increasingly, foundations, are, I am working with someone now who um, will announce probably next year what will be the seventh largest foundation in America. And uh, it will operate for 50 years. So its payouts will be determined by that 50-year limitation on its life. And therefore is given his investment record, uh, he's going to have to spend considerably more than 5%, given how much he seems to earn year after year after year compounded, to spend out that money. So he may be spending 8% or 9% a year having established that 50-year limitation. So I think over time, foundations will uh, differ much more than they do now in adhering so closely to that 5%, which as a reminder, is not 5% to charity. It's 5% of expenses. That 5% includes the rent the foundation pays. It includes foundation salaries. It includes foundation consultants. It even includes foundation <coughs> honoraria to board members for their service. So what often comes out to the charity might be 4.2% or 4.3%. So I think there's some reason to elevate it. But for those foundations who want to continue in perpetuity, uh, they, they, they want to uh, protect their assets. So I want to conclude given the fact that Jerry Stead is not here. I was a colleague of his for a couple of years at AT&T when he was there. Uh, the, I understand that his gift involves international philanthropy. So I want to say a quick word about that. Um, so generally, citizens around the world are taxed at a much higher rate than Americans. And as a result of that reality and their own histories, um, their populations tend to look to government for the delivery of the kinds of services that we might look uh, to the nonprofit sector for. And therefore, they focus on influencing elections. Now, there are lots of associations, but those associations, um, generally speaking, are voluntary and do not in most countries, rely on private contributions. So much is that the case that when people say, who is your greatest competitor in New York, Reynolds, for gifts to Lincoln Center? My answer was always the National Theater of London, the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Almeida Theater, the Paris Opera Ballet, and on and on and on, because they all developed 501c3 fundraising arms in New York City to raise money and create friends of these foreign institutions. And there are hundreds of them in every single sector. So I had a Harvard Business School student examine these theaters to determine whether more money was raised in the US from Americans in private philanthropy than was raised in England for those institutions. And in every single case, the answer was yes. In every single case. So this whole field requires enormous work for us to better understand motivation, to better understand how adapted 
properly to the culture of the country. This enormous source of energy and initiative that could really make a difference in the life of Japan, that could really make a powerful difference in solving problems throughout Europe and throughout Asia and throughout Latin America, can find its proper place in these societies. That's work to be done, both scholarly work and practical work to be done uh, for this next generation. And finally, I want to observe that one of the features that could help both regulate nonprofits and help to regulate foundations is a lot more journalistic attention. One thing trustees want to avoid is their name in the newspaper. And the institutions that we are talking about are central to the life of our communities. They contribute in a major way to the quality of life, to the educational standing, and to the health and welfare of these communities. And publishers and editors need to pay them heed and need to pay them some attention because they are public institutions after all. Well, uh, you have been extremely patient and I am grateful for the opportunity to be here and to speak with you this evening. Thank you very much.